Hey everyone, we're coffee experts and today we thought we'd make your life easier by telling you about the best coffees in the world and how they should taste so the next time you're faced with a multitude of choice, you know how to whittle it down. We'll break it down into simple categories you should keep in mind. Arabica, check. High altitude, check. Nothing below 1400 meters, please. Clean and washed, check. No funky processes, thank you very much. Light roast, check. You can really taste the lands. Mmm. The best coffees are unequivocally worth all the extra money you pay for them. Okay, and to inaugurate this video, let's take a ceremonious sip of one such coffee. That. Before we get started, I just wanted to say that thought pieces like this take way more time and effort than any of our product reviews do and get us way less views. But we just can't help ourselves. It's taken us the better part of a year to research this topic and form our opinions on it. So we really hope you'll take the time to watch this through and a sub to the channel would be much appreciated. We welcome likes and dislikes equally and we'd love to start a fight in the comments below. Let's go. Where you grew up, your genetics, what you ate on a daily basis, how often you ate it, whether or not Michelangelo was your favorite Ninja Turtle growing up, these are just some of the things that impact what flavors you enjoy in food and drink. Has this ever happened to you? You're at a really nice cafe with a couple of friends that are coffee nerds. There's some lo-fi music, a lovely minimalist wooden decor, a very friendly and very knowledgeable barista. Quick vibe check? Excellent. You all try a really exclusive coffee that costs $20 a pop. Everyone, including you, agrees that it was delicious. Except you didn't really think it was. There's some things you do agree with. There was an aftertaste that lingers for ages. It had a light body. You got floral and fruity strawberry-like notes. But beyond that, it's not something you loved and definitely not enough to drink again. So you think there's something wrong with you when you've now spent $20 on a cup of coffee only to spend $200 on therapy because you're hating on yourself for having unrefined tastes. Okay, real talk. You're not unrefined or crazy for not liking something you paid top dollar for and have been told is amazing. P.S. Aren't you also a little tired of being told what you should aspire to like? I've suddenly tasted some very fancy French food that I thought could have used a splash of Tabasco. Maybe no matter how hard you try, you just revert to your old choices. Or maybe you try and try and try and actually grow to like the thing that you didn't before. Both are possible and neither scenario is wrong. There's a reason for why this happens and it goes beyond just refining your palate. There's a lot more to flavor than meets the eye. Sorry, tongue. So today we take you on a fascinating journey through the good, the bad and the ugly side of flavor by understanding how preferences develop, debating objectivity and looking at how we can change our relationship with flavor to open up the possibilities of which coffees make it to rarefied specialty status beyond what we ever thought possible. Oh, and the cherry on top, we had the amazing opportunity to talk to Dr. Paul Rosen, world-renowned professor of psychology at the University of Pennsylvania and nicknamed the world's leading expert on disgust. We've thrown in snippets of our conversation we had with him last year throughout the entire video. So backed by some serious research chops, this video gives legitimacy to the idea of you do you. Before we dive deeper, let's get the basics out of the way. What exactly is taste? Taste is what we experience solely through our taste buds. This includes the five basic tastes of sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and umami or savory. We also have things like kokumi and piquancy, but it's out of the scope of this video, so let's keep it simple. Flavor, on the other hand, is taste combined with smell. It's experienced through retronasal olfaction, which is basically odors that rise up to your nose as you chew on food or have it in your mouth. For example, if you had only taste, you'd probably say it's crunchy and juicy with a little bit of sourness and a lot of sweetness to describe a fruit you just bit into. And I can think of several that fit that bill. You need retronasal olfaction to be able to say it's an apple. Okay, wait, here's another one. Say I said it starts out sour and settles into something more balanced and bittersweet. Quite all right as far as taste goes. Again, once retronasal olfaction kicks in, I quickly realize it's fruit juice that tastes a bit off to be honest. Oh wait, no. This is that $20 cup of geisha. So are there objectively good and bad flavors? 
This is an important question to answer because so much of what we consider to be high quality coffee essentially comes down to what we think is great tasting in the cup. And we're willing to pay an amazing amount of money for this great tasting coffee. We have an entire section dedicated to the fascinating relationship between great flavors and money, which we'll get to a little later on. But let's get back to the question at hand. Are there objectively good and bad flavors? Well, I would say probably no. Well, while the short answer is no, there are, however, flavors that are objectively more interesting than others. It's got, there's got to be something to grow into and appreciate. And if it's very simple, like sugar water, there's nothing to do with it. So like Dr. Rosen says, sugar water is boring and one dimensional. But there's a few things that we can say make for enjoyable flavor experiences. And these are measurable. Two examples of this are aroma and complexity. I don't know much about the dynamics of coffee aroma, but I'm sure over the first 10 seconds of a sip, you get different experiences as the different volatiles get up to your nose and all sorts of things. So I think there are some things you might say are general things that would contribute to the experience and, and, and be the basis for connoisseurship. But there may be other things like acidity, which could go anyway. And complexity is two things. It's not just the number of flavors and the way they're related. It's also the time course of the experience. So when you take a sip of coffee, the, over the next 10, 15 seconds, you have a series of experiences. The more varied and uh, long-lasting that is, probably the better, because your actual sip is only a second or two, right? And you want more than a second or two of experience. Dr. Rosen deconstructs two highly complex and dynamic foods a little later on, so you're going to want to stick around for that. So we've now established that a combination of certain qualities in food and drink make for great experiences. But we often find that we make this jump from an interesting or novel experience in your mouth to specific flavors being more coveted than others. You remember the example of being in the coffee shop with your friends? You agreed that the aftertaste was long, right? and that it tasted fruity, sort of like strawberries. But then there was this leap from that to now suddenly strawberry being an amazing flavor and sought after in coffee. So how does this happen and how do these preferences for certain flavors come about? Let's find out. All of us have this, right? We love certain flavors and experiences to the point where we almost feel like it's a part of our identity. You may find yourself saying, Dude, I love Negronis. I could eat pizza my entire life. Or like my sister, I just don't do coriander. So for me to figure out how I became this pretentious coffee snob, I needed to first understand where taste preferences come from and how they are developed over time. You may think, why is that even important? I know what I like and that's that. Well, it's a beverage we love so much we choose to put it into our bodies every day and we love the way it makes us feel. And through coffee and our preferences, I think we can discover a lot about ourselves. And some of this stuff is just downright wild. Number one, genetics. Well before you've ever put any food or drink in your mouth, you are genetically predisposed to like or dislike certain flavors depending on your ancestry. Yes, it's written into your very DNA. So if you're addicted to sugar, well, that's most people. So don't go blaming your parents. If you're hooked to coffee, you can blame us. But if say coriander tastes like soap to you, then you likely have an olfactory receptor gene that's making this delicious garnish unbearable. Number two is conditioning. And if I had to define this simply, it would be repeated exposure to certain food and drink. There are four types of conditioning. The obvious one would be location. Your surroundings and the things available to consume in the place where you live have a big influence on your preferences. Next would be cultural influence. In many cases, this is even more powerful than location, especially at younger ages. No matter where in the world you grew up, if you're South Indian like me, you ate idli and dosa for breakfast and sambar rice and curd rice for meals. Ha! Huh. If only coffee had tasting notes of curry leaves and turmeric, I'd be a Q grader. Then we have the famous acquired taste. This is another type of conditioning where you intentionally and repeatedly expose yourself to things you may not enjoy at first, like coffee or caviar, to slowly develop a taste for them over time. And the last one is the craziest. What your mother ate while she was pregnant with you actually influences your taste preferences. My mother ate samba rice and curd rice. Anyway, three, we have associations. This is super interesting too, because apparently we're more inclined to enjoy foods that we associate with happy memories. 
Okay, research aside, the reason why I think this is absolutely true is because a very close friend of mine casually consumes Jelusil. And for those of you who don't know what that is, it's Pepto-Bismol's antacid cousin and tastes much worse. I know, it's not like Pepto-Bismol is gourmet food. If I had to describe it, imagine sugar syrup infused with a hint of peppermint and about 50 kilos of pink chalk powder. Honestly, it's like drinking slightly watered down toothpaste, so something truly life-changing must have happened right around the time he took that first swig. It's the only logical explanation. But jokes aside, associations are powerful when it comes to taste, and a lot of the best cuppers in the world use memories to identify what they're tasting or smelling. I'm sure you've all experienced this. One whiff of a particular smell and it's almost like time travel. You're instantly teleported back to a moment in time where this odor was very prominent and research shows that the nature of this moment or memory influences how you feel about that smell or taste. Fascinating, right? The next category is fairly self-explanatory and that's marketing. We are deeply influenced by brands and the stories they tell us. The sheer power of branding is why people still drink Starbucks coffee. Anyway, number five is aspiration. We all have our idols. No matter what your niche is, you have one or more people you look up to and trust. Sometimes it's just easier outsourcing opinions to someone better versed in the subject, but that can be problematic at times when dealing with something as subjective as taste. The conversation around specialty or modern coffee as it stands today is largely driven by a small group of people in the global north and having talked about the other factors that influence taste preferences, it should be fairly obvious why this is an issue. It's like Jamie Oliver controlling the narrative around what is considered good Indonesian food. Sorry, bad example. Jamie Oliver should have no control over any food, period. But you get my point, right? And lastly, we have complexity and dynamics. Some foods are just easier to fall in love with. Any guesses? So I think there are some things you might be able to say would improve the experience, like variety, length, length and dynamics. I'll call it that. I'm very interested in temporal dynamics of food. The great example is ice cream. You put it in your mouth, it warms up, it melts. The aroma builds because the, as it melts, the volatiles get up to your nose. Um, all sorts of things happen. You're going from solid to liquid in your mouth. So that's a terribly dynamic food. Okay, and it's extraordinarily popular. Pizza is another very dynamic food because it has different kinds of things that uh, decompose in your mouth at different rates. You've got the cheese, you've got the tomato, you've got the crust. You've got contrasting textures. And pizza is probably now the most popular food in the world. Oof. I've never heard ice cream or pizza be deconstructed in this way. And it's absolutely fascinating. We just assume most people love ice cream and pizza, but we don't ever think about it more deeply. So now we know where flavor preferences come from, we should really look at the intimate relationship that flavor and quality have. Okay, maybe not intimate. I think unhealthy would be a better adjective here. Okay, so when you hear things like best coffee and award-winning coffee, you can assume that these titles have been bestowed based on flavor implying that flavor is somehow an objectively measurable metric. If you've been paying attention, you get why this is an issue. Fine, you could argue that this is food. What else are you going to measure it based on? Well, there are a few things I can think of, like farmer living conditions, farmer wage, total emissions from plant to cup, to name a few. But let's just say we're okay with flavor equals quality. We still have a big problem in coffee because of how small and homogenous the group defining good flavor is. So, for example, I interviewed Tim Wendelbo for an article I wrote last year and asked him where these modern Norwegian coffee preferences for fruitiness and high acidity, often present in Kenyan and Ethiopian coffees, came from. And he made the illuminating point that it was not due to customer demand. There was a group of educated coffee professionals and buyers, and he said, quote, we kind of collectively changed the preferred flavor in the market, end quote. I'll let that sink in. And we've also linked to the article in the description below if you're interested. Okay, why is that a mic drop moment? Well, it's wild to think that even coffee professionals didn't associate these flavors with the best or most high quality coffees until very recently. And that a small group of people have collectively influenced an entire market based on what they liked. And what they like, we know now, is a function of so many multiple dynamics at play. And more importantly, 
what they like may not always be what you like. But this is also awesome news, right? Confused? Well, it means that it's very clear what needs to be done. If we can somehow make this group that drives the conversation around coffee a little larger and a little more diverse, we'll hear from different people who speak just as passionately as Tim about completely different flavor notes and profiles. This would create a ton of opportunities for new producers, farms, roasters, etc. to showcase their coffees and be part of the next waves. We also need to expand our focus beyond just the cup. Listen to this. You're working in an area where there's a lot of art. It's not just science. There's a lot of art here and a lot of understanding how people work. This was our big aha moment. My brain literally exploded because of how succinctly it was put. Many of the answers are right there in that sentence. It made me realize that what we taste in the cup goes far beyond just flavor. We're influenced by how it's grown, the relationship with the farmer, the stories we're told, the branding, packaging, the music that's being played when you're in the cafe talking to the barista about the coffee. It's what goes on the bag. Words like organic, single origin, etc. It's what preconceived notions we have about certain origins. All of this and much more contribute to what we think about a coffee and what constitutes the best coffee in our mind. But we often reduce all of this down to the objective measure of flavor, which is just wild to me. Coffee is a people business. In fact, it is the poster child for a human-centric business. But in this bubble of specialty, we're a bit too focused on the science of it, right? With this myopic lens we have on, we run the risk of thinking that everything in coffee is somehow black or white. But there's a lot of gray area. Well, brown area, if you will. We have probes, refractometers, specialized burrs, temperature control kettles, etc., etc., and all these variables, which obviously have so much value. But, and remember, this is coming from me, who is clearly obsessed with the science behind coffee, we need to spend more time studying people. It's important to remind ourselves that quality is not discovered, but created. Now, Professor Ted Fisher said that, but I'm gonna steal it for this video. And that, I think, is a great segue to talk about flavor's impact on value. So we've now established that flavor is fascinating. And what's even more exciting is just how early we are in the discovery process of the science of flavor in food and beverage. And within that, the research on flavor in coffee is even newer. If you're interested in going down the rabbit hole, definitely check out Dr. Carvalho's work and her excellent Instagram posts on the Coffee Sensorium. Food and drink for most of us is more than just about survival. It's a showcase of our cultures, central to our relationships, a way to celebrate the good times and get through the bad. So it's not very surprising that we seek out enjoyable flavors in the things we consume. But is there a dark side to our quest for the best coffees? With something like 1 billion drinkers worldwide, coffee is far from a small industry. And with modern coffee's emphasis on flavor, how exactly does that translate into real-world impact, aka money, money, money? For the purpose of this video, we'll keep it simple and focus on Arabica, but the point we're trying to make applies to Robusta too. So let's dive in to how money does in fact sometimes grow on trees. Our starting point is the foundation for coffee pricing, or the sea market. And over the past year, Arabica coffee has traded between $1.50 to $2.50 per pound, which is just under half a kilo. If you're interested in the sea market, we've done an in-depth video that you can check out here or in the description below. Now, if you look at specialty, here's where some wild stuff happens. Exclusive micro lots of third wave quality green beans routinely go for more than $20 a pound. In 2007, the $100 per pound level was first broken for the infamous geisha varietal from Hacienda La Esmeralda in Panama. The 2019 winner of the Best of Panama, the Elida Geisha Natural, was auctioned for a whopping and record-breaking $1,029 per pound in 2022. To re-emphasize, that's versus $1.50 on the sea market. So are we trying to say that the flavors in this coffee are 686 times better than what's available on the sea market? That is some serious value creation. If a higher price automatically implies better quality, what makes these micro lots and heirloom varietals so much more special? Well, it all comes down to what's in the cup, which basically translates to what flavor experiences a cup gives you. In this way, specialty coffee often conflates quality and flavor. But we now know that great flavor is not an objective metric, so you can slowly start to see how this can become problematic. 
Before we get into that, let's take a step back and see how coffees are evaluated. Coffee tasting professionals or Q graders perform what's called a cupping to evaluate a specific coffee and give it a score on 100. If you've bought specialty coffees either at a store or drunk it at a cafe, you may remember reading a number on a bag or be told by a barista that the coffee you're drinking is a 90 plus. In fact, when confused by too much choice, you maybe even scan the aisle and filter your choices down to 85 pluses only. When serious evaluations are being done, they usually perform blind or with no knowledge of which coffee is from where. Ted Fisher says that among specialty coffee professionals, there is, quote, pride and trust in the objectivity of the blind cupping, the epitome of meritocratic process. But at the same time, these conventions constitute a specialized knowledge that marks a certain kind of cultural capital, end quote. So after reading this, it made me think that to get to the point of being specialized enough to score coffees objectively, you've gone through a series of steps, courses, trainings, all which happen to be self-selecting. For example, if you look at Q instructors, the people that train Q graders, 19 out of 52 are from the United States. When you have approximately 36% of instructors from one country in the West, it's hard not to question how much of an outsized influence that might have on what they consider to be great tasting coffee. Professor Ted Fisher talks about a blind cupping he did once and how labeling flavors was something he struggled with, like any novice would, but was then gently guided in a particular direction. Maybe it's raspberry and not pomegranate. So he discusses in the paper how there is a subtext of the proper vocabulary. To be honest, my experience doing sensory training in London was very similar. I absolutely loved it, but I did find myself preaching things like earthy bad and low acidity boring, and it took me moving back to India and tasting a lot of good Indian coffee to change that mindset. When flavor has such an outsized impact on value, what can we do about it and how can we change it? Well, first, maybe we rethink our scoring system or how much importance we place on it. This helps mitigate the mistake many of us make, one of using quality and flavor interchangeably. Perhaps the world needs to move towards a weighted score. Yes, flavor can be a big chunk of that score because coffee is a consumed drink that people want to enjoy. So, of course, you can't expect someone to drink something that tastes like garbage simply because it was grown organically. But maybe we have weights for how it's grown, how equitable it is for farmers on that farm, how much fertilizer is being used, etc. Or as Ashley Rodriguez, aka Boss Barista, explores in her article for Standard and her newsletter and podcast, we explore completely novel ideas like democratic lotteries for coffee, both for how coffee is sold or even at competitions like the Cup of Excellence. She has done some interesting thought pieces on this and more, so we've linked to her piece and Substack below. One thing's for sure, the answer lies in more discussion and healthy dialogue. Next, we can fight the urge to make choices without much thinking. Look, I know most people love a good cup of coffee and it's a compliment to their lives, one that helps them feel energized to tackle the day, not really a focal point of decision making. So how about we make it fun? One day of the week or even month, you try a bag of coffee you wouldn't have tried otherwise for its flavor, but maybe try it for another metric, say for the biodiversity aspect. And who knows, you may end up enjoying something about the flavor you didn't think you would. Or you expose yourself a few times to it, and we know that exposure to something can help you acquire a taste for it. So now your world's opened up. A diverse range of coffees, voices, producers, etc. helps open up avenues for different coffees from different parts of the world, allowing them to participate in the high value creating end of the supply chain. For example, places like India and Vietnam aren't even on the cup of excellence list of countries. Also, climate change is real and developing a taste for say, very well-grown and roasted Robusta will really help farmers command more of a premium for that too. And lastly, question everything about the assumptions we are making. In objective blind cuppings, for example, there may in fact be a baseline of bias we haven't managed to get around. Look, I'm not trashing on the cup of excellence or Q graders. In fact, we think they are absolutely vital and powerful tools in moving coffee forward. But we have to remember that these are competitions run by people, ultimately for people. And no matter how trained they are, they have been influenced by a multitude of factors over the course of their lives. And to assume a 100% level of objectivity wouldn't just be incorrect, it also wouldn't be fun. So the next time you outsource your decisions to the numbers on bags, or to people whose opinions you trust, think about the outsized influence that has on what you consider to be great tasting coffee. If you made it this far, thanks so much for sticking with us. We've talked about a lot. 
taste, flavor, quality, value, and your preferences. We find this whole area of research fascinating and think it's very pertinent to the times we live in as we think about coffee's next waves. Going down the rabbit hole for this video was a lot of work, but it actually left us feeling really liberated. And so hopefully this video broke things down simply for you and you learned something new about flavor through the world of coffee. And with that, it's freed you from the shackles of flavor conformity in coffee and otherwise. And maybe after this video, you'll go down memory lane, reflect on some childhood memories, and think about where some of those peculiar food traits that are so specific to you came from. And if nothing else, that puts a smile on your face. And, and as, as always, always, thank, thank you, you so much, much for watching, watching and brew our